Well, our next speaker is Michael uh, Berger. He is a restaurateur and entrepreneur who is passionate about expanding consumer access to grass-fed and organic proteins through partnering, partnering with ranchers. As one of the founders of the Elevation Burger, a restaurant chain specialising in grass-fed certified organic beef, Michael led the company's growth from a single restaurant to a chain of 45 locations, one of the largest certified organic beef purchasing programmes in, in the United States and the largest organic protein programme of any restaurant group in the US. Michael is a recognised leader in sustainable food supply chains and proteins and currently serves on the board of directors in multiple organisations, including the Organic Centre, and was honoured as the Organic Trade Association's Rising Star of 19, uh, 2015. <laughs> Michael's current focus is on developing custom protein supply chains for food service distributors, manufacturers and retailers through partnerships with ranchers and farmers. I'd like to welcome Michael to the stage. It's great to have a practitioner who's making money out of a changing world. Michael. Uh, good, good morning. Uh, would you be surprised if I told you that New Zealand protein producers were missing profits that were right in front of them that others are capitalizing on? You may be surprised that a short Jewish dude from Washington, D.C. is here to talk to you about it. <laughs> um, especially one who's never been involved in farming, and certainly Washington, D.C. is not known for its beef market as much as it's known for its dysfunctional politics. But uh, that is what I'm here for. Um, I was your second choice, actually. The Burger Batch gentleman um, was not able to make it, um, and he sources a lot of New Zealand beef. and. You know, I think that, that's, a, that's a great story to talk about. Um, I source a lot of Aussie beef. Um, I'll tell you why as we go forward. Um, you know, I think that's a great success story that you all have had with Burger Batch, um, certainly. And it's one that should be celebrated. You know, but I want to be here to tell you about the other side of the story, the opportunities that you're missing, uh, and how to take advantage of those opportunities. So briefly about myself, um, I'm one of the founders of the restaurant chain Elevation Burger. Uh, we started our restaurant group in 2005. Uh, we started with one restaurant in Falls Church, Virginia, which is uh, a suburb of Washington, DC. We started growing in 2007. Uh, and from 2007 through today, uh, we have almost 50 locations. We started the restaurant chain on a fairly simple idea uh, of providing, for more or less lack of a better term, cleaner beef. Uh, and that was beef at that time that we were focused on uh, being absent of antibiotics, prophylactic use of antibiotics in livestock. Um, at that time in 2005, the United States uh, had just recently, three years prior, implemented its national organic program, the NOP, through the USDA. Uh, it was one of the very few uh, you know, kind of measurements, metrics, particularly in the United States, where you could get some sort of certainty around what it was that you were getting. So we selected that uh, as our platform to serve organic grass-fed beef, which has a whole bunch of roll-down attributes that I'll, I'll kind of get into as we go along. Um, for us, that was a big market differentiator. It was also something we really believed in. Um, you know, in the United States, antibiotic use is, in, in livestock uh, is very prevalent. Uh, and there's certainly uh, growing research. Uh, I'm not a researcher. I am by no means a, a medical practitioner. Uh, but I've spent a lot of time around them uh, in my kind of uh, activism in, inside the states. And, you know, there's, there's a lot to the antibiotic resistant, uh, you know, uh, issues that are going on right now. So that was where we started. Um, as we went on, uh, and I should say, Elevation Burger is a fast food place. Uh, so I know as I was talking to some of the folks last night, uh, you know, it, if you hear organic and grass-fed beef and you think about it being served in a restaurant, it's possible you thought of us as a white tablecloth restaurant. Uh, that's not us. We're, we're selling burgers, fries, and a drink for you, and you can walk in and out for about uh, 12 US dollars. Uh, that was one of our goals. In 2005, uh, when grass-fed meats uh, were available in the United States, there was really only one place to get it, and that was Whole Foods. 
And Whole Foods was set up uh, in areas where the top 20, even 10% of income earners were located in the United States. And to us, that didn't really seem fair. It didn't seem fair that only the wealthy, uh, only the you know, educated should have access to product that you know, could potentially be better for them, better for the planet, better for animal welfare. Uh, and so we set out to create a fast food chain that would address that and put it in areas where you know, folks may not have normally had access to that. Um, as, as we've gone on, uh, you know, I've had the opportunity to get really involved in the organic industry. And I do want to say that, you know, I, I, I hearken back to when we started in 2005. Uh, organic was that measurement. Uh, at this point in time, there's a lot of things that have emerged in the marketplace that allows for different third-party verifications, uh, measurements. Uh, organic is not by all, the end all be all, even though, you know, in, in the introduction, I was like, I call it the organic rookie of the year in 2015. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity in other spaces besides just organic. And there's a lot of attributes of organic that can be blown up and focused on separately from just organic. Uh, but I have had a lot of time in the industry where I've been able to spend time with leaders. Um, uh, Professor Leroy uh, mentioned Beyond Meat. Be meat. Uh, I'm personal friends with Seth Goldman, who is the founder of Honest Tea. Uh, he is the chairman of the board of Beyond Meat. Uh, he and I have lively discussions about Beyond Meat. Uh, I'll get into further. I, I, I'll fast forward and give you, give you the cheat sheet. I, I, I have genuine issues with the fake meat movement uh, that I'll kind of start to highlight for you from a consumer aspect and uh, you know, business aspect. Um, but anyway, we've, we've taken the position also in growing our supply chain of partnering with ranchers. Uh, a lot of product in the United States particularly flows through a third party aggregator or you know, a group that has no direct real association with the producers. Uh, one of the things that we did early on, we actually started by sourcing grass-fed organic beef just down the road from us in Virginia. Uh, and we had a scare really early on. That, that in 2005, the United States was not producing very much grass-fed beef, certainly not organic beef. Um, we had found a small producer. He was shipping us beef. We were selling it. We were about seven, eight months into the operation of the restaurant chain. And he calls us up one week and he says, hey, my cattle didn't make weight, so I'm not slaughtering this week. Uh, you're not going to have any trim for this week. And we were like, dude, dude, we, we cannot run a restaurant chain that is called Burger Place <laughs> without hamburger meat. So frantically, we hopped on a bus to like uh, my, my business partner, Hans, hopped on a bus to Chinatown in New York City and started scouring every natural food market in New York. Well, he ultimately came across some product from Australia. Uh, and at that time, Australia had been producing USDA organic certified grass-fed beef. Uh, and that led us to a partnership with a producer in Australia, which then led us further into more partnerships with producers in Australia. Uh, we invested uh, a, a substantial sum of money to partner with MLA, uh, the, the Livestock Association of Australia, uh, to actually go out and do extension programs with farmers. So we were out there in the field talking to farmers and ran ranchers, I should say, about supply chains and how to get product into the United States and that we would buy all their trim and Woolworths could buy all of their uh, subprimals and it would be a wonderful, beautiful relationship and here's the premiums that we'll offer you as compared to what you guys are uh, you know, getting now. And so we ended up signing up a, a group of about 60 different farmers who we still work with today. Um, we've done similarly with chicken as we added chicken. Now we get all of the chicken inside of the United States. Um, so, and, and this may be fairly academic. I know a lot of you in this room may have some context for this, but I do, I do want to go into some of this, how it's defined, particularly in the United States. Um, so grass-fed cattle. Grass-fed cattle is basically what you all know. Um, it is not what we know in the United States. Uh, certainly, 10 or 15 years ago, people didn't even know what it meant. People were like, great, cows eat grass? Wait, I thought they ate corn. Um, so grass-fed cattle, though, you know, at, at, at this point in time, is kind of that bottom rung. It's an animal that is most likely foraging out in pasture land. Um, they can be fed some grass supplement, or, I'm sorry, grass pellets, um, particularly during colder months. 
Um, they can be grain finished. Uh, so we like to refer to our product as womb to tomb, grass fed. That means birth to death. That animal has been foraging and grazing. Uh, there are a lot of grass fed animals that are grain finished. Um, there's a lot of grass fed animals that they won't tell you are eating grain, but you know, there's really a sliding scale of definition in the United States as to what grass fed really means. And generally accepted, about 80% of its feed, I think up until the last few months of its life, if it's being fed grass at 80% rate, lo and behold, grass fed. Then you have 100% grass fed. Now that typically means an animal that is foraging wildly. Uh, they're eating native pasture lands uh, that are not really being sprayed uh, for close to all of the grazing season. And during the season when it's not a grazing season, uh, they're being fed silage, which is largely a hay-based silage. Uh, some of it can be a grass pellet uh, as well. Certified organic takes it to the furthest stretch. And again, I, you know, when we started the restaurant chain, that was really the only metric that, that in the United States you could, you could take to, to, to actually know that you had some integrity in the supply chain. So certified organic goes above and beyond kind of, you know, a lot, a lot of this stuff. So in certified organic, in the USDA National Organic Program uh, for a cattle, and this would go for sheep as well, they must be foraging on native pastures for all of the grazing season. And that grazing season will vary depending on the region. In Australia, in most, re in most regions there, that would be 365 days out of the year. In Nevada, in the United States, that might be 180 days out of the year. Um, those pastures cannot be sprayed with synthetic pesticides or synthetic herbicides. Um, that would be glyphosate, Roundup, uh, in particular, is used very widely in the United States. Uh, it, can be, it has to be a non-GMO feed. Uh, the animals cannot get prophylactic antibiotics. In fact, if they are receiving antibiotics, they must be removed and sold out in a conventional animal. Um, I often hear, well, that's very heartless. What if an animal gets sick? Well, you can treat the animal. You just have to remove it from the herd. But because antibiotic use is so prevalent in the United States, it's a, it's a way to protect against farmers fudging it. Um, And I'm going to skip real quickly to this next slide because in, in talking to some folks last night, I realized that you know, I, I take it for granted everything that I know about the U.S. agriculture system. And my friend Jim over here in the room, wherever he is, please don't get offended by any of the stuff that I point out about our conventional ag system. He'll 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 help you with that later. Um, so, United States cattle system, hugely, I'd say I don't know, I don't have the exact data, but. I'm going to go ahead and guess at least 85% of the animals that are raised in the United States are going to be finished and fed out in a feedlot environment. Now, a feedlot environment is anywhere from 10,000 to 80,000 animals that are on a fairly small set of acreage. They are either on hard compact dirt, they are on loose mud with some of their own manure. Uh, they may even at sometimes be on concrete. Uh, they're being fed a, a ration of grains and grasses and corn, uh, usually trending towards the end of their life at a kind of about an 80% ration. Um, they're being fed constantly during the day. They're in these feedlots for usually about the last probably six to 12 months of their life, depending on uh, you know, their weight gain at any particular time of the year and how efficient that feedlot is. Um, they're going to come into the feedlot probably somewhere around the weight of 800 pounds, and then they're going to get up to something like 1,400 pounds before slaughter weight. Um, there's a three-phased system that gets these animals there, because as you all know here, uh, the anatomy of an animal doesn't necessarily uh, provide for the animal, the anatomy of a ruminant animal does not really provide for that animal to be able to eat grain in such a high quantity. Um, this is actually where some of the antibiotics come in. As they develop acidosis, the antibiotics help to counteract that. Uh, but even to get them to the phase where they're eating at an 80% grain and corn ration, they need to be trained. So we have essentially a three-phase system there. So you have a cow-calf operator. A cow-calf operator would actually be probably like most of you are ranching. That means that they're doing all their own animal husbandry. Uh, when the calf is born, 
The calf will milk with its mother until it's ready to forage on grass, and so forth. In the United States, though, after about six months, after they probably reach somewhere around 600 pounds, 700 pounds, they're going to be moved off to another area. Or they will be moved into another area of that operation, where they are then slowly getting grain introduced to their diet in slow rations to kind of train them to eat the grain, which then leads them into feed outs a few months later, where they're then fed out, as I kind of described, to finish. Now, what does that do? You know, that produces a fairly fatty animal that has a lot of intermuscular fat. It's very tender. Um, it's not bad. Um, but it is also very homogenous. Uh, the animals, towards the end of their life, are probably not as happy as they were if they were at the beginning of their life or foraging on grass. Um, and so, you know, that's us and our agriculture system, or at least our livestock system, kind of as a whole as it is. That, that really changed around World War II for us in the United States. We won World War II with the Allies. We were a military power. Earl Butts, the Secretary of Agriculture under Richard Nixon, said, hey, we need to be an agriculture power too. So let's flip some of the way that our farming subsidies had previously worked. So farmers in the United States get a lot of subsidies. Not a lot of subsidies. They get subsidies. Jim. <laughs> um, I, have to, I, have to watch, I have to watch what I'm saying with Jim in the room. Um, so the farmers at the time, very basically, if you were overproducing, the government would pay you to keep that aside so that you did not bring it to market. So you did not crash the price of corn or wheat or whatever commodity crop it was. Well, Earl Butts said, hey, screw that. Let's bring it all. Corn rose from fence post to fence post. That was one of Earl Butts' famous quotes. And he said, well, bring it on. And if we crash the market, we're going to come in as the government, and we're going to write you a check to subsidize and make up that difference. So what it did is it created a very large production system of grain and corn for us. Um, and as we went on, we needed to find things to do with that. Two of the places it ended up going, one, high fructose corn syrup in the United States, which is prevalently used as a sugar replacement in uh, soda beverages particularly, and animal feed. And so that really helped. And it was cheap. It was cheap, cheap food. Um, supported our population growth. One of the things I can and do say and readily acknowledge is the United States is not ready to establish an entire protein system that would be based on grass feeding animals. It's, it's, not, it's not feasible. It's not feasible for the size of our population. Certainly not to produce it with ourselves, you know, with our own production methods. Um, the fast food industry has obviously benefited from uh, this lower cost, uh, you know, quickly raised beef. But back to why grass-fed and organic proteins are trending in the United States. Um, consumer demand. So uh, as Professor Leroy pointed out, Consumers are concerned about a variety of things. A lot of the things they're concerned about are probably not things they should be concerned about. But if we take away the fake meat discussion, which we can get into later, uh, which we'll get into later, uh, consumers have been demanding in the United States more, quote unquote, naturally raised proteins. Whether that be free-ranging chickens, or cage-free eggs, or grass-fed beef, or no antibiotics chicken, or no antibiotics beef, organic beef, organic produce. Um, these are all things that are developing. So the organic market, again, which going back to it, still is the real only way to, it, it's one of the few things you can measure because it has attributable sales to it. And so it's one of the things that's tracked. Um, the organic industry now constitutes almost 6% of the total food economy in the United States. Uh, that's up from probably 2 or 3% just a decade ago. Uh, it's crossed, I believe, I want to say it was 50 billion this year in sales, the organic industry. Uh, in produce, it's getting close to 20% of our entire produce that's produced in the United States. And we are, we're very good produce producers, uh, particularly in leafy greens. Um, that, that's growing. And so there's this huge consumer driver for better product. Um, some of it is based on just what they read. It's a 
fast-paced social media environment in the world these days and uh, the clickbait that's out there, the things that they're reading, some of it's bogus, a lot of it's true. Uh, and some of the stuff that they're getting inbound to them is making them rethink their food decisions. Uh, nutrition is a big component of it. Uh, the animal welfare is a component of it. More responsible antibiotic use. There's a growing consciousness in the United States that there is a looming potential public health crisis with antibiotic resistant bacteria. Um, there's less inputs. Uh, there's less pollution to the waterways. Um, you know, one of the things that happened over the last couple of years is we had a pretty significant hurricane in North Carolina. And, uh, you know, the North Carolina, this is a southern state in the United States. Uh, excellent hog producers. They produce a lot of the pork that we consume in the United States is done out of North Carolina. They're fabulously efficient at it. Uh, well, in those lots, there's weight, they call them waste lagoons that are basically where all of the waste pools. Uh, and they're separated from the, you know, the rest of agriculture by levees. Well, when the hurricane came through, it broke the levees of these waste lagoons. And there was a significant issue with the water quality uh, that was you know, for in North Carolina due to this coming out of these waste lagoons. Um, again, you know, the antibiotic resistant thing is, is terrifying. They're not terrifying, but it's, if you look at the trending line, something we should probably be concerned about. Um, and so we frequently use manure out of our, um, out of our animal livestock to, to, to spray on our fields. And that's one of the reasons that uh, we're getting more E. coli breakouts. Um, so anyway, so there's this growing consciousness of the consumer that is driving some of this growth in the market. Um, and it's in a variety of areas. It's not just in proteins, it's in produce, it's in nuts, it's in grains. Uh, it's particularly in children's food. Um, we have a huge growth in baby food and kids food uh, that's being produced organic or being produced with some sort of a claim, non-GMO, certified humane, uh, you know, of the like. So kind of what's the landscape of the current marketplace as to where you see a lot of this stuff and what's, you know, what's the international and global marketplace look like? So 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you found this legitimate, you found it in Whole Foods and you found it at farmer's markets. That, that was really, that was where this product lived. Um, it was probably to a degree where the demand was at that point in time. Um, today, there's a lot of large scale users that are using it. Amazon sells organic and grass-fed proteins, not just via their uh, uh, recent purchase of, of Whole Foods, but on their website. Um, there's major grocery chains that are now carrying private labeled grass-fed uh, beef and uh, antibiotic-free chicken and organic chicken. And so, you know, there's a lot of large-scale users that have started to adopt it. There's small-scale users like us. You know, we're, we're in the context of the United States at, you know, 45 restaurants. Uh, we're pretty small. Um, and so, you know, that, that also is growing. The chef-driven concepts where, you know, people are going out for $200 dinners. They're sourcing grass-fed beef from just down the road. Or maybe, you know, they're sourcing New Zealand beef. There's, there is, uh, you know... Uh, a lot of New Zealand beef that can be found on a menu uh, in these smaller scale users. Um, a lot of it's going again those through these third party aggregators. Um, and as I describe a third party aggregator, it's actually, maybe before I go into that, there's, there's a lot of hidden supply. And I think this is, this is the, let me give you the international picture for a second. So you've got, grass-fed meats that are coming out of the United States, not a tremendous amount, Australia, New Zealand, Uruguay, uh, Brazil, uh, Chile recently has launched uh, a grass-fed program in the United States. Uh, Mexico has some grass-fed beef. Uh, Canada has some limited grass-fed beef. That's really the international marketplace that's coming into the United States. Um, some of it's being marketed as grass-fed beef, some of it's coming in and it's being sold as conventional beef. I kind of call that the hidden supply. 
And I think this is one of the areas uh, for New Zealand uh, that is A, most challenging, uh, but B, has the highest potential of helping you capitalize on the opportunities that are there. You're a nation that needs to export. I don't think that's any secret. A huge amount of your beef is exported. Um, a lot of it is exported to the United States. Most of the meat that is exported to the United States is not marketed as grass-fed. In the United States, people find this shocking to find out. But in the United States, at any, potential, at any particular time of year, McDonald's supply chain, all their beef supply chain in the United States, up to 40% of it could be comprised of meat coming from Australia and New Zealand. Both of your countries are significant contributors to McDonald's supply chain. But do you think McDonald's is A, marketing that to their consumers as grass-fed? No. Or B, are they paying any of the producers for a premium on grass-fed? No. Have they been asked about it? Yes. Well, our consumers don't want that, and we don't have any operational mechanisms to really be able to segregate the product, and it all gets mixed in, and we have central facilities, and da-da-da-da-da. OK, fair. Uh, that, that holds a lot of water. That's true. But that's product that was raised here to those standards. And in the United States, those standards, when you call them out and you label them, fetch you a premium. And this is just how you guys ranch. You know, this, this, is, this is just ranching. The whole thing that I described to you probably about the way that we farm in the United States was like head scratching. Like, why, why would you do that? We have grasses. You just let the animal out and they forage. Um, so there's a real, real challenge with where a lot of your product is currently ending up and how it's being marketed. There is also these third-party aggregators, these resellers, that will buy the product. And then they, in turn, will relabel the product. And they will turn around and sell the product. Can I ask a question in the room? Have any of you heard of an organization called Broadleaf? A small number of you. Would it come to surprise you that if I told you that Broadleaf is a company in the United States, one of these third-party aggregators or resellers, that claims they're selling all New Zealand beef, and they're selling it into food service distributors as grass-fed. And I've seen their pricing list, and they're getting a premium on it. Why, you know, why, why do more in this room not know who Broadleaf is? Why is it that Broadleaf is selling that product to their customers at their premiums when none of that is reaching the rancher, or some of it maybe. You know, they get their paperwork when it's imported, as long as they have something that cleared customs with uh, some level of a claim, an affidavit on antibiotic use and grass-fed, that product can then be sold into the United States with those attributes, where they fetch a higher premium. I was sitting last night at dinner with Rowena eating a New Zealand ribeye. Um, and I want you to know this. And I've tasted grass-fed beef from all over the world. I've been to Vanuatu on a trade mission trying to set up some farmers in Vanuatu to produce grass-fed beef and help them bring other product to market you know, outside of some of the island nations uh, and bring it into the more developed world where they could fetch higher premiums and improve their economy and so on and so forth. So I've, I've tasted a wide range of grass-fed beef. Some grass-fed beef is really terrible. Some grass-fed beef is really good. I want you to know, and I say this with all sincerity, not just because I'm standing on this stage, and remind you, I source largely Australian product. We do use New Zealand product in Qatar. Uh, your New Zealand organic designation is recognized there. Um, so I have a lot of experience with the product. Your product, from a taste profile, is one of the highest quality grass-fed products from a taste profile I have tasted. It does not have a gaminess to it. Uh, it is reasonably tender. Uh, it doesn't linger on your mouth. Rowena was probably looking at me last night like I was crazy. I was like pointing in this part of my mouth and talking about like what it tasted like. You know, really, 
there's some really bad, so if you get a piece of grass-fed beef in the United States that has not been raised well, you get a coppery taste, a bloody taste, something that just kind of puckers your lips. And I've had even grass-fed beef that I've mixed into like tomato sauce and you can still taste that pungency. Um, not every nation is predisposed to having diverse grass pastures with good soil that lead to a well-balanced flavor profile. There's some really bad pasture farmers in the United States raising some pretty terrible grass-fed beef. Um, other nations don't have the kind of grasses and soils that you have. I am no scientist, so I will not try and go into the why of it, but I can just tell you that the result of it is a very palatable flavor profile for even an American citizen who is used to the conventional flavor of beef, meaning the corn-fed beef. Um, so there's opportunity there. I will also say, <coughs> getting into the growing the market, because I kind of got there. Um, I'll also say that in the United States, for some reason, generally, there is kind of this chest thumping USA beef, Texas cattle drives, like there's a, there's a pride in production of US beef, as there should be. Look, we are phenomenal producers. We are excellent at agriculture, certainly in terms of what we produce and the quantities and feeding our own nation and exporting. Uh, you know, the farmers have their sets of challenges for sure, but from an overall food production system, we are very good at it. Uh, I do not want to take anything away from what we have accomplished as a nation in agriculture. It is impressive. But for some reason, for some reason in beef, there's this really chest thumping USA beef perspective that's there. And usually when I get into a conversation with somebody about beef and global trade and, you know, that there are countries that you know, have been raising cattle for years. And yes, you know, at one point in the United States, we were fairly predisposed in our prairie lands to raising particularly bison and maybe uh, some cattle. But you know, we wiped out a lot of that prairie land as we went through and developed as we moved east to west. I was like, you know, there's nations that are predisposed to growing grass-fed beef. I'm like, you know, have you eaten a banana that's been produced in the United States or grown in the United States? And they kind of scratch their head. I'm like, well, if you haven't been to Hawaii, and you didn't eat a banana in Hawaii, then you have almost certainly never eaten a banana that was produced in the United States. Why doesn't that register with you? Why do you not care about that? Those other countries produce bananas. Their climate is much more suited for the production of bananas. That's kind of the idea of global trade, right? We fill in the gaps where we don't have it, and we help you fill in the gaps where you don't have it. Um, it's a fascinating phenomenon that I would love to spend hours researching, but it exists. Um, one thing I can tell you is, in the United States, New Zealand is looked at very fondly. Very fondly. Your lamb has a phenomenon. My wife just sent me a picture this morning. She was shopping at Costco with the kids, which is a huge uh, warehouse grocer chain. They have boxes, I mean like here to here and over here, stacked of New Zealand lamb. Boxes, I mean like 30 pound boxes that had the plastic ties on them that people are taking out by the box into the United States and eating. Your lamb is widely acknowledged in the United States. Jim, again, sorry. Jim's gonna talk to you about the US sheep industry later. Um, but for the time being, until our sheep industry grows, which I have no doubt Jim is going to help it do, um, your lamb is considered of some of the highest quality you can access in the United States. That is not the case for a lot of other countries that are producing proteins that come into the United States. I'll be completely honest with you. As we developed Elevation Burger, one of the things we did not do was shine a big bright light on the fact that we were sourcing Australian meat. Um, it just was something that was potentially not going to be reacted extremely fondly to. It potentially, you know, it could potentially have been a weakness and there wasn't necessarily a reason to do it. And so we kind of just were, you know, mum on the subject. We didn't, we weren't misleading. Um, 
So anyway, you're, and, and, and again, you see with, even with the Australian lamb, they have excellent lamb as well. But again, it's, there's, there's a, this is again my perception, and I'm, but I'm you know, fairly out there in the, in the protein world kind of checking on this stuff. New Zealand has a really strong position. So why not develop that position for beef? There are you know, going to be issues in growing that market. But let's, let me kind of put aside some of the, gro the growth in the marketplace. So that's, that is one of the big things, I think, that could, you know, in the, in the hidden supply chain where you guys are directing stuff into the conventional market, um, the, the prevalence of being able to say, you know, New Zealand beef. So v very quickly, though, um, in growing the market, so to this previous presentation on the, on, the, on the fake meat, it is absolutely a growing phenomenon. Uh, we were pitched twice, both by Impossible and by Beyond. They both wanted us to basically be their first restaurant chain to roll it out. Why? Because they both wanted to say that they were associated with the largest organic uh, restaurant chain in the United States. Smart. I told both of them no. Um, including Seth, who I'm personal friends with, and he and I had a wonderful dialogue on it. And at the end of the day, what I said to him was, and what I've said to a lot of people who I've had this discussion with is, we have nothing to hide or, or feel bad about our beef supply chain. We're not feeding these animals. Our supply chain does not rely on fossil fuel grown corn. Uh, it doesn't rely on a feedlot environment that's potentially creating a water pollution issue. It does not rely on a supply chain that is potentially proliferating antibiotic resistant bacteria. Why would I put something on my menu that you guys are highlighting and advertising to dispel meat out of the room? Why, why would I do that? I feel great about our meat. If I didn't want to expose our supply chain to competitive, you know, competitors trying to find it, I would run a reporter to every single farm that we have cattle on, every single ranch that we have cattle on. That's how proud I am of our supply chain and how good I feel about it. So that resonates, I think, with some of the consumer. And so we're all of this information, some of it misinformation, some of it fine information, is coming with the fake meat. I think, and th this was insanely fascinating. I get around, I live in DC. Uh, I have nothing to do with government. I'm friends with a lot of people. I live actually in the, there's a neighborhood called Capitol Hill in DC. It's about, I live 15 blocks from the Capitol building. So I spend a lot of time with a lot of folks in the international community. I spend a lot of time with policymakers. If I need anything, I sometimes can drop down to USDA and knock on the door. But you know, it, it, this, this, I found common ground with one of the largest meat representing organizations in the United States, the National Cattlemen's Association, which oftentimes with the kind of international supply chain or the grass fed, there's, there's been a butting of heads in the past. And I've, I've known this gentleman and, and his colleagues for a while, and there's a mutual respect. You have to be able to have a dialogue with everybody. Um, he and I were chatting just a couple of months ago, and we finally came to something that we really agreed on. We were like, this fake meat thing is a challenge. And one of the best ways that we as an industry who are relying on robust protein sales can get ahead of this and get to the side of it is to start focusing on the producers that have that story to tell. The story that I just told you. The foraging animals, the no use of antibiotics. And it seems like it's something that the industry in the protein world is getting ready to embrace. And that presents a huge opportunity to shift the dialogue around the fake meat. I had the opportunity to be on a panel with, I think it was the Consumer Federation of America a couple years ago. And I sat on that panel uh, with a venture capitalist who had invested in um, uh, Impossible. And he had invented Impossible Meats and, and in Memphis Meats. Memphis Meats is the peachy dish grown meats. And I sat there and I listened to him talk about Impossible. And this was a group of probably 400 people, mostly consumers. And he started describing the process by which they make the Impossible meat. How they make it feel like meat. How they make it taste like meat. How they make it behave like meat. How they make it bleed like meat. And at the end of his description, I was like, why are you saying this out loud? <laughs> 
I do not ever want to eat one of these Impossible Burgers. And when they sent me the samples to my office, I feel bad about it, I made my staff eat it and I told them to tell me how it was. <laughs> um, so anyway, there's a lot of specialty and unique programs that are also developing. One thing I failed to mention at the beginning, which I'm not sure how slip my we sold Elevation Burger about a month ago. We sold Elevation Burger to a company actually called Fat Burger, if you can believe it or not. They're one of the oldest restaurant chains, one of the oldest burger chains in the United States. They operate now with us under, uh, under their ownership. They operate eight different brands with over 400 locations. But it tells you something about the trends, right? If a company called Fat Burger came and acquired the largest seller of organic meats in the restaurant industry in the United States, they know the trends are changing. And they did not buy us to turn us into fat burgers. They bought us to continue expanding Elevation Burger and to diversify their portfolio. But also, this tells you also about some of the sophistication in the supply chains there as to how to bring the rancher to the, uh, to the end user. They asked me in very, very pushy and generous terms to stay on as an advisor because they need me to help them run and continue to grow the supply chain, uh, which I will be doing. I'm also working with several other food service distributors. I'm working with a few extremely large supplement companies to create fully traceable protein supply chains where we are partnering directly with producers. Some of those are Australian producers. Um, Australia. I know there's the, is, the rivalry, the friendship between Australia and New Zealand, in my opinion, is one of the most special things in the world. Um, it really is. Um, I, I think the mutual respect and the camaraderie and the general pokiness that you give to each other is, is, is outstanding. So everything I say with Australia in mind, please know, you know I, I know you guys have a respect for them. They've, they're very good at, at getting their product into that marketplace and getting their premiums. One of the groups that I'm working on one of these projects with, they're in the United States. The owners, they run all of their cattle. The owners are in the United States up to four times per year meeting directly with customers. They are getting very large premiums on their products as compared to if they were selling it conventional. Which, not to say that Australia is not also falling into some of that same hidden supply chain, because they are. Um, So anyway, some of the barriers to growth. Uh, you know, I won't. I, I want to leave some time for questions. I think I have until 10:30. Is that correct? What's that? Five minutes. Okay. Okay. Um, so very, very quickly, there are barriers to growth. Um, fake meat is definitely kind of on the flip side of where I was just saying it might be an opportunity. Uh, for us to have a narrative about this type of protein production, it does certainly represent a threat. Um, that was an extremely illuminating presentation we just saw. Uh, and it is absolutely a threat. Um, and so I think it's something we need to be aware of and develop a story around. And there is definitely a story. Um, industrial agriculture in the United States is always going to continue to be something that's a barrier to growth. Um, but industrial agriculture is also starting to recognize that they need to change some of their practices. So they're becoming, you know, 10 years ago where industrial agriculture was a bigger threat to the market growth, uh, I think it's a less one. I think that they're actually quite interested in getting into some of these supply chains as they've seen the consumer trends. The eating quality. Uh, one of the things that I will say uh, that as you develop ideas and how to capitalize on the opportunities to get into the United States, you know, raising that cow to a certain size, there is an expectation that a ribeye is a certain size, that a ribeye is a certain tenderness. So some particular attention if you are looking to establish dedicated supply chains into the United States, I think there are some raising practices uh, to look at as to how to uh, add weight. I know, you know, our animals in the United States are raised typically to around 13, 1400 pounds. I'm not saying that's how every animal should be raised, but that is what the consumer is used to. Um, there's a lot of misleading marketing. There's a lot of misleading marketing. McDonald's, uh, and I have an exceedingly high amount of respect for McDonald's. Uh, I actually, several years ago, had the great fortune of having one of their former heads of supply chain consult with me for four months. They are 
a phenomenally run company and they've done amazing things in their supply chains. Um, but what is 100% beef? What is fresh beef? And why is it meaningful to the consumer? And I'm picking on McDonald's just because they're one of the more well-known brands, but it's not just McDonald's. There's, there's a lot of brands in the United States that are using certain levels of misleading marketing that are not helpful to those products that really, truly, genuinely uh, you know, embody those attributes. With that, I've talked a lot. Uh, I really thank you for my time uh, and for being here. Uh, this was a really exciting opportunity. I am, hopefully you can see, very passionate about helping uh, your, your ranchers, your farmers bring product to our market and to bring products to other markets. Uh, I have an amazing amount of respect for how it is that you guys have uh, your protein agriculture system developed and how it has remained largely unchanged changed for many years. Uh, it is a fabulous system, uh, and I hope that in the future I'm someone who can help you guys reach more of our markets. Michael, um, I'm Russell Welsh, a farmer from Deep South. Um, how will you handle if New Zealand has to adapt uh, to uh, uh, as farmers to saving the planet, which we're all keen on doing, of course. Um, there's a method uh, called CRISPR, which is effectively grafting uh, different plant species that we've already got as grasses. We can, we can reduce methane by 40%. We can put deeper roots on it to handle climate uh, heating. We could even perhaps in the future, I, I don't know, but I think that they can, if they put rhizomes so that we could introduce nitrogen into the soil. All of these things are, are, are there naturally now. It's a case of using what grass species and that we've already got. How, how would that fit in there? We're not using herbicides and we're, we're fitting with the image of natural and nature. We're just speeding it up. 10,000 years right. of, of breeding in a petri tube shortly. Yeah. Um, not not knowing any more than about it than what you've just said, you know, I think it's it, it reinforces some of the messaging that's already around your meat system that says, look, we already do it well, but we even want to do it better. We want to be better contributors to the environment. To me, to me, that just enhances the narrative around. I think what you already have the opportunity to create a narrative around. I think we've got to look at these things going forward. I agree. Noth nothing should be off the table. They trust me, eh? <laughs> By the way, this thing is amazing. I've never seen one of these. I just were taking the <laughs> a, a, a very, very interesting discussion. Um, I'm very aware of Broadleaf because in 2004 I brought natural beef to them. And we set out to sell New Zealand uh, hormone free, antibiotic free beef. It was the time of Lord of the Rings. And we had a very good profile. And yet we found that when we were trying to sell the product, exactly what you said, we were coming across the American's best approach. And so we actually worked and we got premiums for all our state cuts, couldn't get the, um, the trim as a premium and couldn't get it in the round cuts. Now you've got to the trim mm -hmm. and I think the state cuts, but what about the round cuts? Is, is that something where New Zealand can find some additional revenue for their natural product? It's possible. You know, the, it, it, and you go into a supermarket right now in the United States, and, and you're, you're going to see in, in a private labeled grass fed program, the items that you'll largely see are a one pound ground brick, yeah. uh, a four pack uh, of quarter pound patties, uh, filet, ribeye. Strips, stew meat, sirloins, some, um, you know, kind of roast items here and there, and then it kind of falls off. You're not, you're not seeing yet, uh, you're not seeing really the eye round. Uh, there is a demand for top round to go into a lot of the beef jerky. Um, that, that's certainly there. Um, briskets you're not seeing as widely. Tri-tip. 
Um, so, you know, whereas if you look at a North American Meat Institute handbook and you see, you know, a few hundred items as to how the carcass can be broken down uh, in this market at this point, you're still probably talking about a dozen to 15 different SKUs that are really going to get traction in the marketplace. And that's not to say that you couldn't find some sort of a specialty um, end user that was looking for one or another kind of particular. But as far as what is widely available right now, it kind of sits in that you know, 15, 12, 15 categories. Does that answer? Sure, yes. Um, obviously, we are a bit before our time. Um, but certainly, the the burger is actually the saviour for the grass-fed beef out of New Zealand because that is the largest proportion of the product that we produce. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Mark at uh, Cloverleaf is a New Zealander, and he was very, very dedicated to trying to get that. And he went out and actually made burgers as well. Yeah, burger burger meat is. Yeah. We consume a lot of burger meat. Yeah. meat. It's, it's <laughs> one more question. <coughs> one more question. Yes. Thank you. Oh, no, she's got one. Oh. Yeah. Um, thank you. Are we throwing? No, we're not throwing this. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks very much. Um, so I'm Sue McCarrapeva from the Meat Industry Association. Thank you very much for your very insightful presentation about consumer trends in the U.S. Um, you mentioned that you also have some business interests in Qatar and the Middle East, and I think I read some of that um, in your profile as well. Uh, my question is, are you seeing similar trends, consumer trends, as those in the United States and other parts of the world, and particularly in the M Middle East, and how are um, these kind of naturally produced protein, <clears throat> protein products placing in, in the Middle East? Yeah, a great Thank question, you. and I apologize for not touching on that anymore. Um, yeah, there's there's great opportunity in the Middle East. Actually, our 11 most profitable and uh, highest grossing sales restaurants are in Kuwait. Um, they do phenomenally well, um, and they they feature in in one of the opportunities in the Middle East that is different potentially than in the United States is they are not cattle producers in the Middle East, uh, and so there is almost no reluctance to highlight where the supply chain is. So actually one of the, one of the trips that I've been on to Australia uh, was with our Kuwaiti uh, franchise group. And they brought a whole media contingent out with them to highlight and to blog and to talk about the supply chain from Australia. Um, and they're, they're very keen on it. And one thing, and I apologize, I forgot to put it on the slide, so I forgot to mention it, but I thought of it this morning. A huge competitive advantage that you all have is a, a large majority of what you're producing is halal. Mm. Um, all of our meat in the United States that we serve out of the restaurants is also halal, um, which makes us very unique. And we actually capture a pretty significant percentage of our sales in um, Muslim customers, those, those that follow halal eating practices. And in the United States, especially in the higher quality the grass-fed realm, there's very little uh, halal grass-fed that's being produced domestically. Uh, you and Australia and Uruguay uh, are really the, the global leaders in, it, in its production. And so that, that's another big opportunity. And that is one of the reasons we've been able to really penetrate the, the Middle East market. But d d the short answer to that question is yes, uh, for all those reasons. Well, thank you, Michael. Uh, while the rest of us have been engaged in a methane-induced stampede, you've been quietly getting on and redefining how we should do business. Um, you see the world through very in innovative eyes and uh, have clearly done well, so well done. And uh, we've got a gift for you, uh, clearly generous to a fault and surprisingly still with something left to give. Uh, the Alliance Group deserve recognition <laughs> for presenting you with this gift and thank you very much for your time.